I tried a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Platinum using only Steel-type Pokemon. And I know what you're already thinking, Steel-types are incredible, so surely a Monolock would be an absolute walk in the park, right? <laughs> Wrong! It's true that Platinum has a lot of phenomenal Steel-type Pokemon, and they have great matchups into a range of different typings, but Steel-types have a crippling weakness to being burned alive, buried by an earthquake, or punched in the face. Since this is a Nuzlocke, if a Pokemon faints in battle, it's dead forever. And by only using Steel-type Pokemon, that leaves just 9 encounters in the entire game. With some truly horrifying late game threats, we're gonna need all hands on deck. The rest of the rules for this challenge are shown here and in the description down below. Let's get started. As our journey begins, Professor Rowan gives me the choice of three starters. Naturally, I pick Piplup, who won't become a Steel-type Pokémon until he evolves into an Empoleon at level 36. But since I can't actually get a Steel-type until a little bit after the first Gym Badge, Danny's gonna be pulling off the first part of the playthrough all by himself. Cue Operation Pip the Lup. So, what's the plan? Right. The one-man job is simple. A quick trip to Jubilife City where we meet Looker, deliver a map to our rival society, hunt down clowns to get coupons in an order that might surprise you, and then square off against society in a battle that is nearly impossible to lose. That's all that stands between us and arriving in Orber City. Next is a visit to the Orber Mine to watch Rourke smash some rocks before smashing his rocks with a few bubbles to net us the first gym badge and evolve Danny into Prinplup. Then it's back to Jubilife, where Danny, dressed for revenge, unleashes some penguin vigilante justice on a bunch of incels before beelining to Floroma Town. This idyllic paradise is in need of a hero because Team Galactic is here to stir up some trouble. A swift defeat of the guard outside of Valley Windworks sends us to Floroma Meadows, where we take on the last two Team Galactic grunts needed to get some sweet, sweet honey. With honey, I can catch a Burmy named Tess, and even though she too isn't immediately a steel type, some tedious leveling up brings her to level 20, where she evolves into a trash cloak Wormadame, and with that, Operation Pip the Lup comes to a close as Danny goes into the box. Mission accomplished. But before we continue, Danny and I have one more mission to complete, and that's to tell you about the sponsor of this video, Red Magic. Wait, wait, Danny, where, where are you going? Please don't go, sponsorships are so much more endearing when there's a cute little animal on the screen. Red Magic is a series of gaming smartphones designed to give you an unrivaled gaming experience right in the palm of your hand. Previously, I've praised the Red Magic 8 Pro, but their latest and greatest phone, the Red Magic 8S Pro, is a whole other beast because it's got an S in its name. But that's not the only thing that's different, no sir. The 8S Pro has the latest version of the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 processor to ensure the best performance on the market, as well as an upgraded state-of-the-art cooling system. From my personal experience, the 8S Pro cooling system is noticeably better than the one in the 8 Pro. Plus, the 8S Pro has a gorgeous 3D nano etching design that comes in three editions. I got the Aurora design because the translucent backing means that you can see the phone's cute color little fan come to life whenever you start gaming. Go little fan, go! With Red Magic's number one priority to deliver you the perfect gaming experience, it's no surprise that using the 8S Pro is as smooth as butter. Playing Pokemon Unite feels as dynamic and responsive as playing it on the Switch. And by using GameSpace features, you can completely customize your gaming setup with a range of built-in plugins. Full disclosure, I've only used the Red Magic 8S Pro as a gaming phone, so if you want to use it as your primary smartphone, please make sure your cell provider is compatible before making your purchase. But if you're interested in gaming on the go and you want to learn more about the Red Magic 8S Pro, be sure to use the link in the description and pinned comment down below. Thanks so much to Red Magic for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to the challenge. Tess is able to make quick work of Mars and her normally pretty scary Perugly, which means we're off to Eterna City where the second gym leader Gardenia awaits. But Tess doesn't have to face her down alone, because now we've got a few more teammates to recruit. First up, Rusty the Bronzor, a smooth talking lady killer with a hasty nature that gets them into trouble as quick as it gets them out of it. Heat proof over Levitate is a bit of a bummer, but what are you gonna do? Next is Basher the Nose Pass, demolitions expert and an all around good lad. With some leveling up in Mount Cornet, he evolves into Probo Pass, officially joining the team as member number three. And then, that's it. 
pretty short assembling the team montage, I guess. Not that it really matters since Operation Mow the Lawn is another one-man job. Or should I say, one woman job. Flag on HG, feminist icon. Tess bug bites her way through Gardenia's entire team, and there's not a single thing her grass types can do to stop her. It's total carnage. Bits of grassy flesh litter the battlefield as Tess shreds through them one by one. The pleads and screams of Gardenia's Pokémon being eaten alive only invigorate Tess's insatiable hunger until at long last, the battlefield falls silent and Gardenia has been defeated. Which means we've got a date with Jupiter in the Eterna Galactic building. Normally, her skun tank can be pretty scary, but once again, there's not a whole lot she can do to my steel types. A bit of teamwork between Tess and Basher gets the job done without much of a problem. So, now Heart Home City awaits, though I do take a detour back to Orber's city to visit the museum, where I revive a Shieldon named Saul, wizened beyond his years and ready to provide, at the very least, some moral support. I also catch an Onyx named Ruben from the Orber mine. In order to evolve him into a Steelix, I'll need to get a Metal Coat, which can be thieved off of Wild Bronzor. This takes nearly 30 minutes, since Bronzor only have a 5% chance of holding a Metal Coat, but it's worth it to evolve Ruben from the Pokémon equivalent of Expired Milk into the defensive monster that is Steelix. Fantina, the third gym leader, is next, and since Steel-type still resists Ghost-type moves in Generation 4, this is another pretty easy battle. Tess takes care of Duskull with a few Thiefs, using a Rossberry and some lucky misses to avoid getting burned. Thiefs also take care of Haunter, though Confuse Ray and Hypnosis means that Tess is down to almost 50% by the time she faces off against Fantina's final Pokémon, Miss Magius. Good news is that she can steal her enemy's held Citrus Berry with a Thief to get back some HP. Tess is absolutely dominating the early game. Fun fact, Trash Cloak Wormadame is the only Pokémon in Platinum that you can get at this point in the game who resists all three of Miss Magius's attacks. Unfortunately, Confuse Ray still makes things a little bit touch and go, so after a few turns, I decide to switch to Basher, who paralyzes the Witchy Ghost with a Thunder Wave, and then takes her out with a few Rock Throws. And speaking of Rock Throws, it would rock if you could throw a like at this video and subscribe to the channel. Our team's looking pretty strong as is, but next up is the 4th Gym Leader Maylene and her fighting types, a notoriously bad matchup for Steel-type Pokémon. Even by using all five of my current teammates, we'll be outmanned and outgunned. What we need is a heavy hitter, an ace in the hole that will give us the unexpected advantage. And that comes in the form of Linus the Scyther from Route 210, who quickly evolves into a Scizor with the use of my second Metal Coat and a trade to my Uncle Gintendo. With Linus on board, it's time to execute Operation Punch-Out. Maylene leads with Metatite, and I lead with Linus. After taking the small chip from Fake Out, a technician-boosted wing attack gets a clean one-shot. That brings in Maylene's own ace, all according to plan. Linus is able to tank a neutral Force Palm no problem, letting him go for a slow U-turn to bring in Ruben for free. Our beefy boy has to take a nasty, super effective Force Palm, but being the defensive tank he is, it barely leaves a dent, letting him retaliate with a massive dig that gets the KO on the next turn. That just leaves Machoke, but Tess can come in and do some damage with Psybeam. Then I switch back to Linus, who tanks a Karate Chop on the switch, and ends Operation Punch Out with one last wing attack, netting us badge number four. With the new level cap of 38, Danny can finally evolve into Empoleon and rejoin the team. Rusty's also evolved into Bronzong, so as we head into the fight against Crasher Wake, our team is fully evolved for the first time in the playthrough. Crasher Wake leads with a very scary waterfall Gyarados, but I've got a plan to take him out quickly. It's called Operation Sparks Fly. See, Linus knows Natural Gift, a move that changes in power and type based on the berry held by the user. So with the right berry, Linus has access to a quad effective 60 base power electric type move, boosted to 90 base power by Technician, which should be more than enough to one-shot Gyarados even after the drop from Intimidate. <laughs> I attached the wrong berry. So forget Operation Sparks Fly, it's time for Operation Please Please Don't Crit Any of My Pokemon Wake or else I'm totally screwed. Linus is dead to a critical hit waterfall here, so I decide to hard switch into Danny. 
Now, Danny has a pretty atrocious moveset right now because in the early game, he was the only one of my Pokemon that could learn Rock Smash and Cut, and now I still don't have access to the move deleter. Fortunately, by fishing for defense drops with Rock Smash and miraculously dodging a ton of waterfall crits and flinches, he's able to take out Gyarados before things get too shaky. Though my primary answer to Crasher Wake's Floatzel is now sitting at 30 HP. Quagsire is second and threatens my team with Mud Shot, but Tess only takes neutral damage, and her hidden power type is Grass, which can be used to deal massive damage to Quagsire. It's not enough for a one-shot, so unfortunately Tess gets hit by a Yawn before we take the second KO of the fight. That means that last is Wake's previously mentioned Floatzel. Tess tanks a Brine and then uses Bug Bite for a solid bit of damage while also eating Floatzel's held Citrus Berry. But then she falls asleep from Quagsire's Yawn, so I switch to Rusty on another Brine. Rusty's holding a Zoom Lens, which will boost the accuracy of their Hypnosis to 72%. With a little bit of luck, we'll be able to put Floatzel to sleep before we need to switch out. Rusty tanks a Crunch and misses a Hypnosis. I decide to risk a potential crit for a second chance at a few turns of sleep here. Crunch doesn't crit, but Rusty misses a second time. That's easily the worst performance of Rusty's life, so far. Well, I switch to Basher on a critical hit Crunch. I'm hoping he's bulky enough to tank a super effective Brine, which he thankfully is. This lets me paralyze Floatzel with a Thunder Wave so that we now have the speed advantage. Then it's back to Tess as Floatzel gets fully paralyzed. Time for a quick wake up. On our guaranteed first turn of sleep, Floatzel goes for a Brine for solid damage. We'll survive a second one, but with Brine doubling in damage once we're below 50%, Tess needs to wake up here and she does. And not just that, she lands a critical hit hidden power, knocking out Floatzel and winning us the fourth gym badge. That was really lucky, and there was no reason that fight should have been that hard, but somehow it was. We're all trying to find the guy who did this. Yeah, come on, whoever did this, just confess. We promise we won't be mad. With Operation Please Please Don't Crit Any of My Pokemon or Else I'm Totally Screwed, masterfully executed with professional precision, Cynthia asks me to deliver some medicine to the Psyducks on Route 210. I'm happy to oblige because if I don't do it, surely no one else will, and it's not as if the champion of the Pokemon League has time to be running all over Sinnoh. So I give the secret potions to the Psyducks and... Wait, wait a minute, what the heck, Cynthia? If she was just gonna come this way anyways, what was the point of having me give the Psyducks their medicine? Well, it turns out that this whole Psyduck errand was just a foot in the door technique to ask me to do another errand for her. Cynthia knows that if I refuse to help some sick Pokemon, then I'm an asshole. And now that I've already said yes to that, surely it's not too much trouble to also deliver an old charm to her grandma in Celestic Town. Very sneaky, Cynthia. I try to say no, but she really wants me to do it, so it must be important to her. I guess it's off to Celestic Town, and there I have my first fight with Cyrus, which at this point is still incredibly easy. Linus just bullet punches his entire team. As thanks for delivering the charm to Cynthia's grandmother, she gives me the HM for Surf. So then it's off to- Oh, hi, Cynthia! You're in Celestic Town too, huh? Well, seems like you kind of just asked me to deliver the old charm so that you didn't have to talk to your grandma. Not a great look. Anyways, with the HM for Surf, I can head to Fuego Ironworks to catch a Magnemity named Livingston. Their jolly nature isn't the best for being a special attacker, but their expertise in all things tech will be a huge boon to the team nonetheless. A few levels later, and they've fully evolved into a Magnezone. After that, my team takes a short trip to Iron Island. Doing a few multi-battles with Riley that definitely didn't almost go wrong means that I'm trusted with an egg. And inside this egg is the final member of the team, the last member of HG's 9 that will hopefully take us into the Hall of Fame. A few wind sprints with my egg in tow and out pops Yen the Riolu, an amazing addition to the team. Not only can the Grease Man function as both a physical and special attacker once he evolves into Lucario, he's also actually fairly speedy, unlike almost all of my other steel types. Speed's not much of an issue against Byron though, who also fancies himself a steel type trainer. All three of his bulky boys fall to a single Aura Sphere from our newest comrade, winning us the easiest gym badge of the entire run. 
With the exception of a few small texts, Candace's ice types are also pretty straightforward. Operation Daybreak is a tight three-man job. Livingston one-shots Sneasel and Piloswine with a single flash cannon apiece. Rusty comes in against Obama Snow's focus blasts and takes the chance to set up a sunny day and put her to sleep with a hypnosis. That gives Linus the signal to come in and clean things up with an X-scissor on Obama Snow and a priority bullet punch on Frostlass. The team's in and out before Candace even knew what hit her. But now it's time to face off against the mighty Team Galactic in a series of moderately challenging mini-boss fights that culminates with a more than moderately challenging final battle against Cyrus in the depths of the Distortion World. With his Pokémon finally at full power, I had to put together the perfect team of six Pokémon for Operation World Saver. I lead Danny into Cyrus's scary Houndoom. He opts for a Will-O-Wisp turn one, so a Surf gets a clean one-shot after that. That brings in the Earthquaking Gyarados, but I'm prepared for him with a quick switch to Linus. Learning from our mistake against Crasher Wake, Linus is now equipped with a Petcha Berry, which means that Natural Gift is an easy one-shot. Third is Honchkrow, but yet again, we're prepared with Basher, who's come out of the box to easily tank a Heat Wave. Basher and Bird trade off attacks until a Rock Slide puts us out on top and causes Cyrus to bring in his ace, Weavile. Without a way to hit Steel types for super effective damage, this ferret is anyone's kill. I opt for Livingston, who gets the one shot with Flash Cannon so that they're already in when Cyrus brings out his final Pokemon, Crobat. A single Thunderbolt takes him out, winning us the battle and saving humanity from utter destruction. And with the innocence of the world restored, it's off to Sunny Shore City to face down Volkner. Most of his electric types are easy fodder for Ruben. A couple digs take out Jolteon, Raichu with Focus Blast is handled by the queen of the early game, and Luxray is paralyzed by Basher and taken out with another dig from Ruben. Volkner's Ace Electabire has Fire Punch, but even a critical hit barely phases Saul in his debut battle. After doing some damage with Metal Burst, Ruben comes in on a Thunder Punch, tanks another super effective critical hit Fire Punch, and finishes off Electivire with one last dig, winning us the 8th and final Gym Badge. And with all the Sinnoh Gym Leaders defeated, it's almost time to challenge the Pokemon League for a chance at becoming champions. But before that, there's one final fight with our rival Society. Throughout our journey, he's been a total pushover, a saloon door of a human being that you can walk through without much thought. But getting beaten and battered by every man, woman, and child you come across really does something to a guy. It changes you. I'm not sure what finally broke society, but steps from the Pokemon League, he's become an absolute monster. Maybe it was when I purposefully drowned three of his Pokemon in our multi-battle at Spear Pillar. Whatever it was, all six of society's Pokemon now have a way to hit my Steel types for super effective damage. This is a very scary fight, made only somewhat doable by having a pretty solid level advantage thanks to the Elite Four's high level cap. For example, his lead Staraptor, who has a minus speed nature, manages to get outsped by Livingston with their jolly nature and one shot with a single Thunderbolt. That, however, immediately brings in the big gun, otherwise known as Torterra with Earthquake. I came a bit unprepared for him since the best answer I have is an Ice Beam tech on Danny who won't survive an Earthquake on the Switch, which means I'm probably going to need a sacrifice. With a heavy heart, I bring in Tess, anticipating that she won't be strong enough to take out Torterra before going down. The damage from Earthquake and the pitiful subsequent damage from our Iron Head confirms my suspicions, but I don't have any other play. So I just go for a second Iron Head, and society actually just switches out. Rapidash comes in and takes a huge chunk of damage from a critical hit Iron Head. This is incredible because now I can bring Danny in on a Fire Blast that does solid neutral damage. With Danny out, I'll be able to kill Rapidash with a Surf and be in the perfect position to outspeed and kill Torterra with an Ice Beam when they come back in. That is, unless a nonsensical bounce manages to paralyze me. The immediate full paralysis here isn't a huge issue since we can still take out Rapidash with a Surf on the following turn after just tanking another Fire Blast. But with the speed drop from the paralysis, we obviously no longer outspeed Torterra, meaning that unless I want a dead penguin, I gotta switch out here. I bring in Linus, who moderately tanks an Earthquake. 
Then we can get a one shot with Natural Gift that's become a 70 base power ice type move with a held Palmig Berry. You might be wondering why I didn't just switch to Linus in the first place, but having him take damage here is really bad because he needs to be at full HP if he wants to safely switch into a close combat from Heracross. Since Rapidash is now knocked out, I was hoping that Heracross would come in immediately after Torterra goes down, but since it's Snorlax instead, we've got a problem. A U-turn does solid damage to our chubby foe and grants me a switch into Yen, who's holding a Shuka Berry that halves the power of an Earthquake. Then we get a quick and dirty kill with a close combat that leaves Society with his final two Pokemon. Heracross comes out next though, and unfortunately, I'm completely pinned. Close combat does massive amounts of damage to all my Pokemon, and even though Linus might survive a non-critical hit, it makes no sense to risk him moments away from the Elite Four. So, for the second time in this fight, Tess becomes my sacrificial lamb. And this time, it works. The fact of the matter is that Wormadame just gets woefully outclassed by the end of the game. It's not her fault, and after a truly incredible early game performance, it really stings that she's not able to ride off into the sunset with the rest of the team. But her sacrifice here means that we're able to beat society once and for all. A wing attack from Linus gets the one shot on Heracross, and then a combination of Linus's U-turn and a psychic from Rusty take out Floatzel, winning us the battle but society is just a harbinger of what's to come. The Elite Four is filled with Pokemon sporting powerful fire, ground, and fighting type moves. My days of bidding farewell to team members is far from over. This is going to be an absolute bloodbath. To have even a chance of glory, I'm gonna need to put together a team of six that's the best of the best. Here they are, all at the level cap of 59 to match the level of Lucian's Gallade. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for Operation Finale. The first step of my plan is the easiest to execute. A Aeron and his bug types are pretty low leveled and have virtually no way to hit Linus, who manages to get knockouts on Yanmega, Vespiquen, Heracross, and Scizor. A U-turn on Drapion does good damage and brings Livingston in to finish off the battle with a single Thunderbolt, winning us the first of the Elite Four battles in spectacular fashion. But next up is Bertha with her ground types, and it's here where things could get out of control. She leads with a Whiskash, and I lead with Danny. A Choice Bex boosted Surf on turn one comes just shy of a one shot, which means that Bertha's floppy fish can hit a nasty super effective earth power for almost 50%. A full restore reveals that the first Surf was a low roll because the second one does indeed get the one shot. That brings in Hippout on second, who only gets to set up permanent sand with her Sandstream ability before going down to a single Surf. But third is Glysaur, and unfortunately Danny does not outspeed her. So now I'm in a bit of trouble. Yen knows Ice Punch and has a Shuka Berry to avoid getting one shot by Earthquake, but with Glysaur's physical bulk and Yen's minus attack nature, Ice Punch isn't enough for the one shot, so we need to get Glysaur to around 75% before bringing him in. My best bet is to switch to Linus, who at least takes neutral damage from Earthquake, but a nasty critical hit on the switch means that I can't stay in. The best I can do is go for a U-turn to bring in Rusty, who's hopefully bulky enough to tank two Earthquakes with the help of a held Shuka Berry. The first Earthquake does 54 damage, meaning that a second one should only do around 108 damage. And using a damage calculator, I find out that Rusty will actually survive 15 of 16 damage rolls, so as long as Glysaur doesn't get the highest high roll, or a critical hit, Rusty will live this earthquake. Losing Rusty here is a truly devastating blow, made more frustrating by the fact that in another life, Rusty could have just had the ability levitate, making them immune to ground type moves. Honestly, if you try this challenge yourself, I'd recommend just resetting if your Bronzor doesn't have levitate. With Rusty dead, I still need some additional chip on Glysaur, so the only thing I can do is bring Linus in for another U-turn. This one crits, so Glysaur is absolutely low enough for Yen to come in, tank a Shukaberry nerfed Earthquake, and take the KO on Bertha's problematic Glysaur with one Ice Punch. That just leaves Bertha with Golem, who falls to a single Aura Sphere, and Rhyperior, who also falls to a single Aura Sphere, though that's only because she had a minus special defense nature. Thanks to the special defense boost from Sandstorm, without her naughty nature, I'd most likely be looking at another death here. So, silver linings, I guess. But without Rusty, our matchup into the third member of the Elite Four is really rough. 
This Bob Ross looking mother has a ton of speedy fire types, and with Rain Dance, Trick Room, and Earthquake, Rusty would have been phenomenal here. The remaining five members of Operation Finale are really gonna need to pull through. My lead is Danny, one of my two Pokemon who aren't weak to fire type moves. I was hoping that Flint's lead Houndoom would try to set up Sunny Day, but he just opts for a fairly strong flamethrower before we set up a rain dance. With the 50% boost to our water type moves, a priority Aqua Jet is just enough to one-shot Houndoom with the help of a held Mystic Water. But that brings in Infernape Second, who happens to know Mach Punch, Flare Blitz, Thunder Punch, and Earthquake. He's also faster than my entire team, so my only hope here is for Danny to survive a non-critical hit Earthquake and kill with a Surf. If he doesn't, the run ends right here, but thankfully he does, and a Surf now also boosted by Torrent gets the one shot. That brings in Magmortar 3rd, who threatens with Thunderbolt, making it fairly safe to switch to Livingston. With the rain still up and a held Akaberry, a flamethrower on the following turn does next to nothing as we're able to fire off a fairly strong Thunderbolt that appears to just barely avoid activating Magmortar's held Citrus Berry. With the rain stopped, I gotta switch to Yen, who's also holding an Akaberry to survive another flamethrower, though a critical hit would have still easily gotten the one shot. From here on out, we're gonna need to get pretty lucky with critical hits, that's just how it goes sometimes. Since Yen managed to also not get burned, he can take the KO with a close combat on the following turn. That brings in Flareon 4th, which means it's time to dodge several more critical hits. Saul comes in on a massive overheat, though the special attack drop means that subsequent hits will do significantly less damage. So I can set up a Stealth Rock as Flareon goes for another overheat that activates our held Citrus Berry. It might seem a little late in the match to be setting up Stealth Rock, but it's my only play here. Flareon goes for a Will-O-Wisp to burn Saul, so a Rock Tomb does just a little bit of chip. Then I switch out to Danny. An overheat comes out and mercifully doesn't crit, meaning he survives with just 21 HP. That means that we can finish off Flareon with a priority Aqua Jet. And as Flint's final Pokemon Rapidash comes in, the 25% from Stealth Rock does just enough damage to put him in range of one single torrent boosted Aqua Jet, winning us the battle by the absolute narrowest of margins. Beating Flint is a massive weight off my chest, but there's really not much time to relax because Lucian is still a pretty big problem. Sure, his Psychic types don't have an amazing matchup into Steel types, but his Bronzong knows Earthquake, his Alakazam knows Focus Blast, and his Gallade knows Drain Punch, which all make things much trickier. Especially since Linus is the only member of my team that isn't weak to fighting type attacks. The plan is to lead with Linus and wing it. We outspeed Lucian's lead Mr. Mime, so he easily falls to a single X-Scissor. I'm hoping that Gallade comes out second so that we can just immediately take him out with an Expert Belt boosted wing attack, but Lucian goes to Alakazam instead. I go for Bullet Punch instead of X-Scissor, since Bullet Punch is a two-shot and gives me a chance to crit Alakazam before he attacks, but that doesn't happen and a Focus Blast hits really hard. Once again, a crit would have just ended the run right there. Espeon is third, so I again go for Bullet Punch, but again don't land a crit, meaning that Linus gets hit by a soft psychic, which also would have killed with a crit. The risks there would have absolutely been worth it if Lucian had just sent out his damn Gallade, but I guess he's saving him for last because Bronzong is his penultimate Pokemon. So a U-turn does solid damage as I switch to Danny on a weak psychic. Then a Surf leaves Bronzong with a sliver, letting them retaliate with a massive critical hit Earthquake. Danny is an absolute fighter, I'll give him that much. After Lucian heals, a few Surfs take out Bronzong, finally bringing in the dreaded Gallade. But with Linus at such low HP and nobody else able to tank Drain Punches, it's time to make another sacrifice for the greater good of the run. And sadly, that burden falls on Saul. He did his job clutching out the victory against Flint, and for that, I'll be forever thankful. He was an integral member of the team, and his impact will never be forgotten. Rest well, my king. With the free switch into Linus, we're able to outspeed and one-shot Gallade, winning us the battle against the final member of the Elite Four. But with just four team members left, it's hard to see a clear path to the Hall of Fame. Cynthia's team is stacked. I mean, sure, Spiritomb and Roserade aren't much to write home about, but Togekiss and Lucario both know Aurasphere, and the former has the perfect combination of bulk, power, and speed to be an absolute pain in the ass for my team to deal with. 
Not even Livingston one-shots Togekiss without a choice specs, but then that obviously leaves them exposed to getting killed by Aurasphere, since we don't outspeed. Milotic is another bulky tank that has to be respected, and then of course Cynthia's ace Garchomp is an absolute monster, being able to hit every single one of my Pokemon for super effective damage. She also outspeeds every single one of my Pokemon, so going into this fight, I am sweating bullets. I'm taken back to the very first time I fought Cynthia as a wee lad a ripe 16 years ago. And frankly, she's even scarier now. I'm not about to reset here, so one way or another, this playthrough ends right now. Cynthia leads with Spiritomb, and I lead with Danny, the best of boys. With two surfs, he can knock out Spiritomb, taking only a small amount of damage from a Shadow Ball in between moves. Danny's typing perfectly baits out Garchomp, so once again, we've got to risk a critical hit. This time, it's the deciding factor between knocking out Garchomp with an Ice Beam, or getting swept by the most cliché end runner in the history of the franchise. Garchomp fires off a massive earthquake, and the only reason Danny has even a fighting chance is with the help of a held Shukaberry. His health bar slowly ticks down from the green into the yellow until it stops at 75 HP, signaling that Danny has survived the hit and is able to get a clean one-hit kill with an Ice Beam on Cynthia's monstrous ace. It's a moment for celebration to be sure, but as you might have guessed, it's painfully short-lived. For in order to win this fight, Danny now has to go down. With one last Aqua Jet, my beloved starter gets off some damage into Cynthia's Lucario, and then, like Rusty and Saul before him, he falls. Danny's sacrifice means that the Amazing Yen can come in to square off against his mirror match. He outspeeds to get a one-shot on Cynthia's Lucario, bringing in the dastardly Togekiss fourth. So it's time for another sacrifice. An Ice Punch does a solid chunk of damage, but without a freeze, it's not enough to save Yen's life. Yes, we have a Choppleberry, so Togekiss's first R Sphere never kills, but that's just so that Yen can get off a little bit more damage with Dark Pulse to bring Togekiss below 50%. With his job done, Togekiss's second R Sphere sends Yen to his grave. But this means I can bring in Linus, and since Togekiss is below 50%, but not low enough to cause Cynthia to heal, we can finish her off with a 60 base power electric type natural gift. That means that Cynthia is down to just two Pokemon. It's Linus and Livingston versus Milotic and Roserade. The plan is to U-turn to Livingston and kill Milotic with a Thunderbolt, but because Milotic will outspeed Livingston, if she manages to crit one of her two Surfs there, I'll lose. I could let Linus go down to get a free switch into Livingston, but then they're locked into Choice Specs Thunderbolt and left to deal with Roserade all by themselves. With Cynthia still holding on to at least one full restore, that's not a matchup I'm willing to risk. So, it's time to dodge just two more critical hits. That is, it would be were it not for an unbelievably clutch critical hit from Linus as a U-turn brings Milotic all the way into the red. That means that Cynthia will heal on the next turn. So even if Milotic were to land a critical hit with her first surf, which she doesn't, Livingston is able to cleanly kill Milotic with a Choice Specs boosted Thunderbolt. Just like that, Cynthia is down to her final Pokemon, Roserade, and she can't do a damn thing to Linus, who two turns later takes out Roserade with a bullet punch, stealing the victory from Cynthia and winning us the entire run. That was a pretty wild playthrough. Save for a few moderately challenging gym fights, the first 90% of the playthrough was a breeze compared to the last few fights. Losing Bronzong early in the Elite Four definitely made things harder, but I hope you were as on the edge of your seat as I was during those final few fights. As always, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed watching, it'd be great if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. Or don't, I don't know, but I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future ROM hack challenges. You should also subscribe to my highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it's cut down to a video on the main channel. And you should consider subscribing to my Patreon or becoming a channel member on YouTube, which are the best ways to directly support the channel. The links to everything are in the description down below. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit. Nice.